around. This is about, uh, we're talking about come and go electrical problems. These are electrical problems that are there sometimes and sometimes they're not. And uh, what we had, um, what, we've, what we've seen from time to time on vehicles is stuff that uh, people are bringing and they're saying sometimes my car does this. The scary ones are the ones where they say it blows my fuse from my stoplights or something that makes the car quit going down the road. And you work, 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 work on it, and you can't figure out why the stoplights are blowing the fuse because you don't find any shorts anywhere. And sometimes it's just difficult. Your world is what you make of it, though. And so what we have here, I worked in a while. This is a story. Back in 77, I was working at a place called Davis Auto Service. And one day, a lead technician went head to head with a 75 Monte Carlo that would intermittently lose its ignition power feed while it was driving down the highway. So he's driving down the highway, and he'd quit. And you'd sit there for a while before it start back up. We were having that problem even back then. And that's what the, it was a car like that one, except the one that he was working on was light blue. I just found that one right there. Now, for the ones of you that have been familiar with HEI, this is basically a sort of an overview of what HEI looks like. You know, your ignition switch basically is going to power up B and then the plus. And your C goes to the coil, the negative side of the coil. And then basically over here, you get your pickup coil on that. And then there's also a ground. So this has got to be grounded to the stripper. You got orange and violet. You might notice that that sort of reminds you is the uh, Duras Park on the Ford, your orange and violet. And this is one I got online. But anyway, the old four pin module is what he was dealing with. That's all he had to work with back then. Well, you know, I overshot the time. He says, I'm going out Bellwood Road. I need you to, uh, well, if I look at your watch in about 30 minutes, if I'm not back, come looking for me. And I looked at my watch and 45 minutes had gone back because I got caught up doing some work on another car. And so I jumped on the old shop truck and it looked about like that. And it was in about that good a shape too. And we headed, I headed out there to where he was and I found him out there, not happy, waiting beside the road, leaning on the fender of the car. And so, anyway, so here's actually where the problem wound up being, was the bulkhead connector where it's coming from the ignition switch through the bulkhead. And then you got alternative to, you know, basically they're talking about, don't worry about all of that. This is people building hot rods and stuff. Uh, but you're, basically you got power going over here and you're, you know, you started from scratch. Never mind that. He got a piece of, four inch piece of 5 8 heater hose out of the back of the vehicle, uh, the old shop truck, and he stuck it over his pocket knife and went in there to check spark because he forgot to bring a screwdriver. And those strands in that heater hose will carry that high voltage spark really well and it fired him up good. And, but it had regained its connection here. And that's what wound up being wrong with that particular one. The push back pin and the bulkhead connector was what was causing that. But basically, if you had power here, but you didn't have power coming out of the bulkhead connector, look there and you find a problem. Yeah. All right, so you got come and go wiring problems all the time. Uh, mildly annoying to deadly, depending on which circuits it fall. All right, so even when a shorter open is consistently present, it's not always easy to pinpoint the exact location in some of these wire harnesses. Now that wire harness uh, set up right there is an older car. That's a 92 Crown Victoria. See all those wires? And there are times when we had to go looking for wire harness. Well now, you know, if you're satisfied not doing any of this kind of work, if you don't want to be the guy, the go-to guy that fixes things nobody else can fix, then maybe this isn't for you. But this is where I lived for years and years. I was always finding stuff. And the other, a lot of times the other shops would run out of ideas. There was a, uh, I mentioned this earlier, I think, but there was a, a uh, Ford Expedition. And when they drove it in the rain, it would uh, start honking the horn and flashing the lights. And they had been working on it at a dealership down in Florida until they got tired of working on it. The field service engineer went down there and told them to replace all of the the door switches because he thought it might have something to do with perimeter any theft and it only did it when it was raining and they ran it through car washes and they wet it with a hose and they never could find out what was wrong with it and that kind of thing and so uh, what I did was you know I gave Zane a job all ago and he you know found that little connector and I basically when I got it over there and I pulled it in they, what they told me was there was no pressure really they says if you can't fix this uh, because the other dealership has drived several times and the field service engineer has given up on it. If you can't fix it, then Ford's going to have to buy it back. And, you know, it's going to look bad on us. And so I got to thinking and I knew that the blue, the dark blue wire feeds the horn because I remembered that circuit number and, the, and it was between this connector and that connector and this particular wire harness. And I says, if 
that horn wire was scratching against ground, it's going to send little spikes back into the uh, remote anti-theft personality module, which is a wrap module, which is a different module than the wrap module on a GM, which is retained accessory power. Anyway, I looked down in there and doing a visual inspection, I found a place where I saw copper where that uh, blue wire was touching a bracket in the engine compartment. And I could actually pull that, just gently pull it against the bracket where I saw copper and make this thing happen. And so I, you know, taped that back and got it out of the way and put a tire wrap on it and went and told the, the, the Ford guy that was in the office of the service manager that we were good to go on that one. Wasn't all that hard, but I did have to tell them exactly where it was. I couldn't just say, found a shorted wire and fixed it. You know, when you're doing a warranty repair, particularly one as ticklish as that, they want to know exactly between which connector and which connector and where it was. The location is a grid that's drawn where it was on the car so they can basically go there and figure out what went wrong. Anyway, in a lot of cases, the smartest thing to do is to get some lube and do a quality permanent overlay. You start from where you know the wire is starting. You go to where you know the wire is supposed to be going to. If it's a short circuit in there, you clip the existing wire out and you run another one. Put it in a loom, run it so it stays out of trouble. If possible, run it in the original harness so that it won't look like some yo-yo has been working on it. And so you can actually do an overlay. If it's an open circuit, just do an overlay. But it's always best. I like to cut the wire out anyway because you don't know if that open circuit might have been there. You know, might be turned into a short circuit later on. And one way or another, if you've got one that's coming off and it's feeding us, and I've done these before too, if it's feeding a whole bunch of different legs going in a whole bunch of different directions, you got to find out which one of these is shorted. We'll talk about that again in a minute. All right, the wire harness is the car's nervous system. You know, that's a sort of a harness that's already that's been bought, ready to put on the car, and it's a brand new one. There's your junction box slash fuse panel and all that. Now, this AC harness was damaged by the belt. See, it came in here with an air conditioner problem. The air conditioner wouldn't cool. Interesting thing about this, we put the refrigerant uh, uh, tester on it. It was basically it had R130, well, no, it had R12 fittings on it because it was an older Buick Roadmaster. And so we went ahead and used our refrigerant identifier, and we found out that it had R12 fittings, but it was completely charged up with 134. But nobody ever changed the fitting. That's why a refrigerant identifier is so important, because I could have pumped 134 into my R12 tank and wound up with a blend in my machine tank, right? Anyway, uh, there was a girl that was here at the time named Christina, and she found this. She says there's not a, they're not reading the ground coming from the compressor. And she actually found that this was uh, rubbing against the belt and it had actually cut one of the wires completely in two. This is what it looked like after she fixed it. She actually soldered those wires back together, put shrink tubing on them, put a fresh loom on there, and tied it back where there was no way to get in the belt. How I got in the belt to start with probably because it was disrounded by somebody that did some work on it or something. Pay close attention, by the way, when you're doing some work on a vehicle, diamond belt, whatever to make sure that the crank sensor wire or some other wire doesn't get down into the belt so that it drives away and maybe the next night when it's raining and thunderstorms that are in the bad part of town that it quits because you let the crank sensor wire get against the belt because you they figured it'd be eight, you know, this kind of thing. All right. Uh, moving components like brake pedals and shifters can break the terminals off the wire. Seen that before, where we have to go in here and try to the shifter won't work and you have to go in there and push that button to make it go and we'll look down in there and because the shifter has continually been bending the wires it sort of breaks the end off the wire and the shifter won't come out apart no matter what you do. Uh, the, the constantly bending wire like on the brake pedals like I was talking about on the Lincoln. You put, keep pushing the brake, pushing the brake and it keeps working the wires it can break them. Think about that when you're troubleshooting. Now it's a good idea to be checking the circuit in question with something that will tell you when you found a problem. So while you're manipulating the connectors, you be watching the circuit that's giving you trouble. And if you're manipulating connectors and you see that light wink on, you push on the harness, it winks on, you pull on it, it winks off. Stop jerking on it and find out where that's happening at. If you find a short down here somewhere because you were manipulating it up here, you need to try to figure out by watching your light what now, if you just pull on the wire harness and you're not have a, you don't have a light set up or a buzzer or a beeper or a something to tell you that the thing is come and gone, you're going to run into trouble. And you may move it away from whatever it's shorted out against 
And if you do that, you're going to wind up with a situation where you think you've got it fixed and they may even pay you your labor costs. But that harness got worked its way over there to begin with and it's going to work its way over there again if you don't know where it was you found it. Look for exhaust pipe. I mean, look for exhaust. And on some of these pickup trucks where the wire harness is, is really thick and it's crammed back in there, look for it to be rubbing against an air conditioner line. If it rubs against an air conditioner line and it'll rub down in there, you'll see copper. It'll make a mess and you'll have to fix all of that. Sometimes it can be kind of aggravating and hard to get to. Uh, knowing when your harness manipulation causes a problem to come and go, you can spend a lot of time looking for it. I always get really sick about one that stops giving the problem while I'm working on it and I can't get it to duplicate it again. Really annoying. All right. You can find shorts this way. Get you a breaker that's a sort of a weak one. Sometimes you have to special order these. You notice that's an eight ounce breaker. That's got less tolerance for a short than a 10 ounce fuse. The difference between a fuse and this breaker is this breaker will open and close when it here feels a short. Open, close, open, close, open, close. And a lot of times you can unplug your components. If you've got a short and you've unplugged your components and that short's still there, <laughs> get this cheap little rig and they make these things you can buy them that'll actually adapt you know something to a fuse and you hook it up with a light bulb in series and then I'll show you a second make sure the breaker is amperating it too high if you put a 30 amp breaker on there and the, and the circuit can't handle 30 amps and it's got a dead short you may burn some wires up so that's why I usually like to use a really weak breaker like a 10 amp or something like that this is how you're going to do it. Get your marker lamp ball, hook it to a circuit breaker, and then on the other side of it, you're going to make, let that circuit breaker go to that fuse. This is a temporary hookup, right? Okay, and so what happens here is, let's say you've got a short the ground on that one right there. You can, with your tool in place and the circuit energized, the breaker will cycle, and the light will be on when the breaker is open. So when that breaker opens up, this ground is basically going to light that bulb. When the breaker is closed, the bulb will go off. And you're going to see that bulb going think, 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 think. It's going to be clicking on and off. If you're looking at something like courtesy lights and they spider rub out and go all over the car, get in the car while the light's going on and watch your courtesy lights. Just look around. The one that's not coming on and going off real dim is the one that's the leg that's feeding that one is the one that's shorted. Ain't really that complicated. If you've got a forward looking infrared camera and you can get to the harness, and you can measure that, you'll see one leg of that heating up, and that'll tell you which one you need to go find the short of. Uh, I've actually seen people that are putting running boards and stuff on their truck, running screws in there without any regard for the fact that there's a wire harness behind it, and it'll go in there and short out to the body, you know, and then they'll bring it in for some kind of repair on that. You decide the best way to find it after you put this on there. Every vehicle is different. That's an example of how that's supposed to work. Though. This is an engaging starter situation. Now, I mentioned this to Zane while ago out there. This is not one you can guess your way to the fix on it. You better be able to read a schematic and analyze it, or you will never find a problem like this one. 103,000 miles, three liter engine. This was very similar to the little Ranger that we got out here, except it was a year newer. It was at the dealership. Sometimes when they'd switch the key on, the starter would just start spinning. And then when the engine would start, it would keep spinning until you dropped it in drive and then the starter would quit spinning. Obviously because the neutral safety switch was taking it out of the loop. All right. When it came in on the hook, simply switching the key to the run position would engage the starter and fire up the engine. Of course, it would keep on spinning, you know, like it does, a little overrunning clutch working overtime and all that. All right, this is the wiring on this thing. I basically simplified this wiring instead of, like in the shop manual, it's going to go from one page to another. And sometimes the way that I like to do this, and everybody does it a different way, is I'll take the wiring schematics off of several different pages and I'll put them in paint. And I'll basically draw it the way it's actually wired up and make my own schematic so I can analyze it. That's what I did here. All right, there's your ignition switch. You notice when you got a dotted line around there, that means you're not seeing the whole component. When you got a dotted line inside the component that's hooked to a bunch of switches, that means that all of those switches move together. All right. 
when you've got a rail like that, it means they're fed by the same power. This is not too complicated. You might notice that fuse 20 is fed by a different terminal from the ignition switch than fuse 24. Okay, so when you turn it to start, fuse 24 feeds power through there, operates the, inter I mean the uh, starter relay, and then the battery junction box is feeding that and it spins the starter and that's what's going on right here. And over here you got a couple of other things that are sent by different fuses. Removing the starter relay would disengage the starter. See, uh, pointed to a short circuit somewhere between the transmission range sensor and the ignition switch, maybe? I don't know. All right, so when we take a, the relay out, we pull the relay out, we put a light bulb here, All right? We want this light bulb to be lit up as long as that relay, see since the relay is energized and causing this based on something that's coming from up here this way somewhere, we're basically pulling the relay out. Also remember, remember when we put it in gear, it, the starter stops spinning, so that means the problem has got to be up this way somewhere. Not going to be between here and here, it's going to be up that way somewhere. Alright, so we got all that. The short the power was available any time the key was on. So we had power right here. As soon as you turn the key on to run, we had power right there. Alright. When it's in the start position, the start terminal on the ignition switch is supposed to carry power through here. Click that over and all that. Spins the starter. That ain't too complicated. Where might the problem be? We experimented a little while the test light was glowing. When you remove fuse 20, and we used, we randomly snatched fuses just to see if any of them would kill it enough. Kind of done that before too, uh, which would cause a problem with the So pulling fuse 20 would cause it to go away. And that was in this very familiar looking thing. You notice we had it took loose because we were looking behind it and all. All right, now then, fuse 20, right there, we pull that fuse out, the light went dark. All right, it carries power from the ignition switch run terminal down to the radio in the central timer module. This goes down here, and it also goes over here. And then you might notice that fuse 28 is right here. So if I'm killing this, it must be feeding through this. Now, the irritating thing about this is while this was going on, we never pulled fuse 28. I don't even remember why we didn't pull fuse 28, but we got it fixated on this. But when we pull that one, this light goes dark, which means without that fuse in there, of course, the radio won't work. And this is crazy stuff. I have actually seen it where the wipers were acting really crazy and wouldn't work right. And we were scratching our heads trying to figure out what was wrong. It was on a little Ford Contour. And we noticed when we unplugged the radio, it didn't happen. And so we down into the boneyard and got a radio out of one that was totaled out down there. Brought it back up and plugged that radio in and it fixed the wiper. And so, you know, you, you can track that down if you wanted to. Uh, but anyway, that was a customer pay instead of a warranty ticket. One way or another, uh, we got these two circuits here. We got 1000 and 1002. Are these two shorted together somewhere, you think? Uh, nothing whatsoever to do with the starter. It's not supposed to happen. All right, since so pulling fuse 20 killed the short, was it possible that these two circuits were together? Maybe the circuit 1000 was back feeding through the ignition run power through fuse 28 to the starter relay coil? Maybe. Something's happening. And that's the only path that can really be taken is coming back that way. All right. This is what it looks like on the module. That's an actual picture on this particular truck of those two wires. See how they're right next to one another? Circuit 10102 enter the CTM connector right there. All right. So look at this schematic for a minute. If the wires aren't shorted together and we determine that they weren't, what else could be wrong? Think about it. Possibilities, guys. Come on. Don't just sit there and wait for me to spoon feed you the answer because I know a lot of you have tuned me out and you're not learning anything. What? Radio. Radio is a possibility. I mean, you can unplug the radio and see what it would do, right? And the central timer module is another possibility, isn't it? Because look at that. That same fuse feeds the central timer module and then fuse 28 goes over here. Well, what the heck is this here for anyway? Does the central timer module ever start the truck? 
I mean, why would they even have that hooked up like that? This is an actual wiring schematic right here of the way it does. All right. And you got to remember this was on several different pages in the Ford book. All right. I started wondering why was it the CTM module and the radio needed to know the ignition switch was in start? Why did the radio need to know? Why did the CTM need to know? Go to the symptom chart pinpoint test in the radio section, I found an error. Found a mistake in the book. According to one particular test step, the circuit in question C, I put C above, but I didn't put the test step up there. Circuit 1000 fed through fuse 28 has to be juiced up before the radio will work. But that simply wasn't the case on this truck because I removed fuse 28 and the radio still works. So I pull this fuse and turn on the radio and the radio still works. And see that those are the two wires and there they were on that connector right there. All right, I would also reveal the only reason the CTM gym, incidentally, the central timer module is what comes on the truck is a cheap little module. Anytime you buy a replacement module, you get a gym module which is a more a smarter module that's got more guts to it. But you know the central camera module and another it does it turns on some of the warning lights and it also operates the wiper relays and all this kind of stuff, you know, so that the wipers we used to have to replace these little CTM modules because sometimes the wipers would come on by themselves. You know, because it operated those. Alright. So it interfaces with remote keyless entry. So it needed to know the circuit was related. So this is the shop manual reads this way. The gym illuminates the interior lamps with an unlocked signal received from the remote anti-theft personality module. That's the wrap module. The illuminated entry feature will be canceled if 25 seconds have elapsed. Since the illuminated entry feature was activated and the courtesy wrap feature is not activated, this is an algorithm they typed in there when they built this program. If the gym receives a request from the wrap module, remote transmitter lock button press, and the courtesy lamp feature is not activated. So, Basically, it cancels it, you know, if you hit the lock button. If you hit the lock button, they go off. Right? If the ignition is in the runner start position and the courtesy route feature is not activated. All right, that's the route module. And incidentally, if you're seeing those route module, that's the key number. I mean, that's the, if it has a keypad on the door, that is the keypad number. This one here didn't have a keypad on the door. It didn't have a lot of wires going to it. This one didn't have a route module. None whatsoever. All right, so the gym module cost $200. The radio could have been disconnected to see if the problem returned because what happened while we were working on it, the problem went away, which was really annoying. Since fuse 28 wasn't needed on this vehicle, it had no reason to be there. You could pull fuse 28 and nobody would care. Only if it had remote any theft personality would fuse 28 even need to be there. So we pull that fuse and we sent the Ranger on its way. The problem never happened again. Whatever happened, even if the radio or whatever was fouled up, pulling the fuse was the fix. You got me? Have you figured it out? But you had to be able to analyze the way that current flowed in order to do that. Now, develop the desire to read. Get good at reading schematics. There are times when simply reading the description and operation section of a particular system is crucial to understanding the repair plan. Now, granted, there are other times when reading description and operation tells you very little of anything. But the times when it tells you a lot, those are the times where the rubber meets the road. Recognize it, learn it, do it. Now, knowledge is power, and whenever you try to guess your way to a fix, you usually fail. If you're used to guessing your way, one of the most damaging things that can happen is if you guess your way to about five or six different fixes and you think you've unlocked the mysteries of the universe, like I was talking about on that one the other day, after a while, you're going to run into one that your guess in your way just doesn't work. All right. Now you're going to find this description and operation section. Uh, and that one of the things I like about, you know, I'm not here to push all data, but one of the things I like about all data is they'll have all of that stuff pretty well laid out the scene. And description and operation is something that's extremely important. And just about all your auto manufacturers, they want to kind of give you an idea of what the algorithm is written like. Occasionally, you'll find a mistake if you're really sinking your head in. Okay, so if I give you guys a pop test on this tomorrow, are you going to be able to pass it? Let's try taking that test right there. Everybody take that test. Right now, you've got about enough time. Go through that test, answer it. 
and I'll give you a break. <laughs>